Thank you for joining us for um, our, our April Arkansas Valley Audubon Society program. I'm Megan Wilbar, museum coordinator for the InfoZone Museum at the Rawlings Library. Tonight we have Keith Bruno joining us to teach us how birds fly. Keith is a community naturalist for Audubon Rockies where he runs ecology programs at the Hershey Foundation Four Mile Ranch located near Pagosa Springs. He received a master's degree in natural resources with an inter uh, environmental education certificate from the University of Idaho. He enjoys teaching about birds, native plants, pollinators, food security, snow science, and generally anything that gets him outdoors. He will be answering questions at the end, so please type your uh, questions into the chat box. Um, we also have Dr. Peg Rooney, who you know from the entire series of programs. She is the president of the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society. Um, and we thank you, Peg, for uh, your continued efforts to bring us great programming, and I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Thanks, Megan. I want to welcome you all here tonight and encourage you to join Arkansas Valley Audubon. Our membership information is on our website, uh, Southern Colorado Birds, abbreviated SOCO, so socobirds.org. And then I also want to invite you to join us uh, on our fourth Saturday bird walks. They're back. Uh, so on the fourth Saturday of every month at nine o'clock, we'll meet on the deck at the uh, Nature and Wildlife Discovery Center in Pueblo, and we'll take a leisurely stroll along the Arkansas River. So bring your binoculars, a hat, sunscreen, insect repellent, water, and a mask, and we hope to see you then. And now I'll let Keith take it away for uh, the mechanics of bird flight. Thank you, Peg. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Megan, both of you. Um, uh, we're so great to work with. Um, and hello to everyone out there in uh, the web world. <laughs> this is the first time for me using StreamYard. Um, and Megan just gave me a tutorial uh, to get me started. And we figured it out. So um, that said, uh, there might be some minor hiccups in terms of me either seeing your chats until the end um, and or just some other differences that I haven't uh, occurred because mostly... Uh, or I haven't run into because I've mostly worked with Zoom. But um, yeah, let's see. First of all, I want to say thanks to Peg as well. So Peg reached out to me um, via a uh, Audubon uh, Colorado Council meeting and said, hey, would you be interested in you know uh, doing a presentation with Arkansas Valley? I said, absolutely. And I believe that uh, my coworker and fellow community naturalist, Zach Hutchinson, has done one with you in the past. Um, and then the, uh, we went a step further and Peg said, how about something on, you know, lift and drag the mechanics of flight and uh, how birds fly? And I said, well, that sounds fun. I haven't actually given a presentation on that before. So this is the first time I've done this presentation. And so um, it's it, it's entailed me doing some extra research and learning some mechanics of flight that I perhaps didn't fully understand before. So it's kind of fun to be doing something new. Um, and um Happy to be here with you guys tonight. So uh, let me jump over to my other screen here. Okay. And please let me know if for whatever reason, either you're not seeing images on the screen or, um, you know, I'm either advancing the slides too fast or, uh, you know, if, if, if Peg also needs to stop me for whatever reason, feel free, Peg. You can cut me off at any point and I won't be uh, hurt at all. So, um well, good deal. Welcome, everyone. And again, I'm Keith Bruno. I work at Audubon Rockies. I'm based in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Um, and let's see, uh, I fall into uh, the kind of education corner of Audubon. You know, Audubon's kind of founded on kind of the three pronged approach of education, science, and advocacy. Um, and, uh, you know, my role is largely to encourage people to get, you know, try and get people interested in birds. Um, but I get to do a lot of different things as Megan read. Um, some of my job requires uh, or actually allows me to expand and do uh, various other disciplines like snow science or, um, you know, working with the Women Each Audubon chapter to build a native plants garden. I know that um, you guys have 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 dove into native plants yourselves, I believe, and pollinators there in the Arkansas Valley. So good on you. Um, I really think that's fun and really important work. Um, and, uh, you know, I do, uh, I do serve as a board member on the Women Each Audubon chapter. So I'm a board member with them. 
and work closely with the chapter on a lot of projects. And maybe at the end, I'll kind of tell you about some of the projects we've got going on and Peg can tell me about some of the projects you guys have going on. I'd love to hear about it. So, um, but we'll go ahead and dive into uh, talking about flight. And, you know, I wanted to start it off the slideshow really with, uh, you know, a powerful image like this. Uh, though this bald eagle is not in flight technically, um, it looks like it's somewhere in between uh, either landing um, or fixing to take off or just balancing itself on this snag. And uh, this was taken the Christmas bird count the year before last um, by Daryl Saffer, who is actually a, a fantastic uh, wildlife documentary maker uh, who's located here in Bogosa Springs. And when we found out that he was uh, in our neighborhood, so to speak, um, we quickly roped him in. Um, he's very passionate about ecology at large and uh, any pictures he takes are pretty fascinating. So um, at the end, I'll, I'll direct folks to some of his videos if they're interested in, in checking out Daryl's work. But this was a picture he took of a bald eagle. And I think the neat thing on this picture is um, you can see, you know, really the size of the wings. <clears throat> and it gives you kind of a, a sense of the musculature that an eagle has to have in order to power wings like that. So. Um, if nothing else, it's just a, a kind of an awe-inspiring picture. But um, we'll we'll finish the slideshow with another eagle, and I bet you can guess which species that would be. So um, I figured I'd dive into a quote just to kind of you know get us there. Um, and this is from 1904. I cannot describe the delight, the wonder, and intoxication of this free diagonal movement onward and upward, or onward and downward. The birds have this sensation when they spread their wings and go tobogganing in curves and spirals through the sky. Um, I found that in <clears throat> kind of a rare document, excuse me, from Alberto's, Alberto Santos Dumont um, uh, from the Sensations and Emotions of Aerial Navigation, 1904. I thought that was uh, well spoken right there. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, it kind of uh, conjures this uh, you know, um, this thing that many of us chew on all the time, thinking about flight, you know, what if we could fly? Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, you know, the closest thing we can really get to it is, um, you know, the squirrel suits that you see people in jumping off of things and semi flying, uh, with a nylon suit. Um, but it's not quite the same. I don't think having never done it, but, um, I'm sure it is quite exhilarating in its own right. Uh, but, you know, the, the mechanics of what allows a bird to fly are pretty fascinating. And, um, you know, I figured we'd start out with just kind of reviewing feather types, because certainly feathers have a lot to do with flight, everything to do with flight, really, but uh, combined with the musculature and the skeletal functions of the, of the bird's body. So um, this is a, a sample slide that was that I took from the Cornell Lab Ornithology site. And if you haven't done it, um, Cornell uh, site has a uh, fantastic set of resources that are all about feathers and all about, you know, flight. Uh, well, not so much about just flight, but feathers, really. They do a deep dive. And so if you want to learn more, I would encourage you to go there. Um, but you can see these kind of are, you know, your standard, as they put it in the bottom, the seven broad categories of feathers based on structure, you know, what they're used for um, and where you would expect to find them on their body. So, um, you know, kind of going left to right across the screen, you can imagine uh, those wing feathers and those tail feathers have a different structural integrity to them than, for example, the down, the contour, the semi-plume feathers. Um, you know, the, the, the tail, the retrocease feathers are uh, the veins, and that refers to specifically, um, you know, the portion that essentially is on either side of the rachis. The rachis, R-A-C-H-I-S, is the main stem of uh, of the feather itself. Um, and the vein on a the veins are symmetrical on a retrocease, a tail feather, versus you can see on the wing feather um, that it's asymmetrical. You've got uh, typically um, a narrower portion of the feather on the leading edge of the feather and a wider, typically softer portion of the feather on the trailing edge of the feather. So when it's oriented in flight, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on the primary feather arrangement on the wing when we look at that. 
Um, but you know, you think about uh, some of the different purposes in a in a wing feather versus a tail feather. A tail feather, if you imagine a brown creeper or a woodpecker working its way up a tree, um, there's a lot of stiffness in those tail feathers that kind of helps um, the bird almost like a kickstand to kind of uh, stay upright and balanced as they work their way up, uh, either drilling or picking um, insects from the, the tree's bark. The, the down and the contour and the semi-plume feathers, or actually, let me back up. Um, the contour feathers, if you imagine the majority of the body feathers actually fall into the contour feather arrangement. And those, you know, are typically um, arranged in a way where they overlap. And that's really important, the way that they overlap, because it uh, essentially allows for less air turbulence when they're in flight. Um, it helps provide more buoyancy when they're in the water, uh, more waterproofing at large. So the contour feathers are very, very important. They don't have the same stiffness. They're typically a little bit softer, um, but they can also be showy, just like this contour feather has spots on it. You know, you think about uh, ducks, for example, and some of their showy plumage. You know, it's really mostly in that those contour feathers that you see that. Um, the semi-plume and the down feathers, you know, we think about uh, down, of course, um, is, you know, provides warmth when you essentially overlay uh, fluffy feathers that trap a lot of air like that, you get an insulating effect. So down feathers, pretty intuitive there, you know, and obviously a lot of times you'll expect to see, um, you know, just fledged birds or, or even nestlings um, in, in more of a down, you know, uh, initial coat, cause that's going to keep them warm before they can really develop their flight feathers. They don't quite have those until they really step off the edge of the nest. Um, the semi, the semi plume again, you know, has some warm characteristics to it. Um, the rachis is a little bit longer on it. Um, but sometimes those are along with the phyllo plumes are more like important in terms of courtship. Um, you know, you imagine, uh, birds with, uh, really showy feathers on their head, um, maybe on their tail. And you can imagine um, the need for uh, impressing a mate. And so sometimes a semi plume and phyllo plume, where it's got, you know, a long rachis, the phyllo plume specifically has a long rachis, but then it has just those little um, assorted uh, non barbed uh, feathers at the top. And that kind of allows for more showy function than anything. Now the bristle, um, the top right, um, if you think about a common night hawk or uh, a flycatcher, um, they tend to have, you know, people, they almost look like whiskers. They come off right at the base of the bill. And even woodpeckers have these. Um, and, you know, it's uh, there's some different philosophies about what they're used for. Some folks say, uh, you know, maybe it helps to actually trap or catch insects on the wing. You know, I've heard that. But there's maybe more evidence that shows that it actually is kind of a sensory um, addition or accessory. So when you imagine an owl in flight or, um, uh, again, a common night hawk or a, a flycatcher, you know, maybe there's some um, way for them to perceive depth, et cetera, um, as they're flying. And then, <clears throat> let's see, I guess that's, yeah, I, I think that's all I wanted to really point out about feathers. I'm not going to do a deep dive on barbs and barbules, but essentially, um, you know, if you imagine the long stem of a feather, like the tail feather being a, that's the rachis, and then you have the vein on either side, um, you usually have a barb that comes off of the rachis directly, and then off of the barb is a barbule, and those have a different, you know, capacity of interlocking um, depending on where they're used in the body. So um, do a deeper dive on your own if you are interested in learning more about feathers. There's a lot out there. Um, this next slide is uh, a review, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, and, and don't feel like you need to memorize these. I certainly don't have all these down, but this is um, this is essentially an image or a, a schematic, like a drawing of a Clark's Nutcracker, um, and uh, the Clark's Nutcracker without feathers. So um, you can imagine where some of the actual feather tracks originate without looking at it without feathers. I think it helps to kind of imagine, you know, um, what the bird's body looks like without feathers. So um, you can imagine where the primaries and the secondaries, which we're going to look at in the next slide in more depth, 
originate really off of almost like that hand structure, you know, and they actually connect into the actual tissue and the skin and the bone themselves. Again, with the tail feathers, the, the, the innermost retrices, the middle tail feathers connect to the bone. And that what that allows for is, um, you know, more strength. And uh, when you think about steering and maneuverability and stability, um, those are some big pieces that you get out of the primaries, the secondaries, and the retrices. Um, okay. So again, a review of feathers on the wing. So now we're looking specifically at a traditional bird's wing. Um, obviously, bird's wings can look very different. So this is, um, you know, a little bit more probably leaning towards... Uh, I don't know, maybe a, a Canada goose or a snow goose right here. But, um, you know, it could be a lot of different birds. And I'm going to go ahead and actually before I put up the terms for each one, see if you can quiz yourself on, on what these groups of feathers are. So um, without before I state it, you know, uh, you can imagine that those feathers, number one and number four, the label number one and four, have a different purpose than some of those feathers that are up at say, you know, three or seven, um, you know, because where, where they are positioned on the wing, um, how long they are, how stiff they are, um, their function is gonna be different versus those that are gonna be uh, more overlapping and insulating. So I'll go ahead and pull up the terms. So um, now you should see in the top right of your screen um, an identifier for each number. So um, I've been talking already about the primaries and the secondaries. So that would be number one and number four. Both feather tracks you would expect to find typically on average nine to ten feathers, but you know that really um, can vary. For example, um, uh, let's see, flamingos um, and storks and grebes can have uh, eleven primaries. Um, Ostriches can have 16 primaries, which is interesting because they are really a ground-dwelling bird. Um, but there must be some math to that. Um, but yeah, like I said, you know, most passerines, perching birds, have you know 10, um, nine to ten species, uh, nine to ten feathers per primary and secondary track, and you can count them across here to to kind of uh, find that number. Um, now, as you go up in each section, respectively. You can see there's the primaries that are the long uh, finger feathers, essentially, right? And they have, uh, as I pointed out before, they're actually considered the remiges, both the, the primaries and the secondaries are remiges, which are flight feathers. And they have stiffness. They have, you know, a, a narrower leading edge um, and then a, a wider trailing edge. And <clears throat> then you, and those connect all the way up into, you know, essentially, uh, the hand bone. So those are really, you know, provide a lot of thrust and power uh, on a down flap um, to, to really propel the bird forward. Now, if you look at two and three, two is actually a set of coverts. So remember, those coverts are, are, are going to be more like your contour feathers. They're going to overlap those primaries. They're going to give you a little bit of um, less drag, or excuse me, um, they're going to be uh, provide a little bit more aerodynamics when you're in flight. Um, and they're going to have some color as well sometimes, but they're not as structural as number one. Uh, number three, the alula, you know, that can be sometimes one feather or three. Um, but whenever uh, you find an alula on a bird, if you've ever found a dead bird, um, or if you bird band, um, look for the alula feather because it uh, it's typically this kind of... Um, you know, a little rogue feather that's kind of out at the edge of the wrist, actually really comes off the wrist. Um, and you can see what the wrist of the bird would actually be right there above approximate to number three, in between three and seven. Um, and that's essentially where that bird can articulate its wing. Uh, the, the old world name for the Alula is the bastard feather. So uh, it, it really doesn't have a whole lot of purpose, but it probably helps sometimes when in landing or stalling, um, may serve a function there. Uh, the uh, four, number four of the series, again, those are closer to the body, closer to the wing pit. So they're not as um, important for providing thrust, but they're kind of like um, uh, on a plane. You can imagine the backside of the wing and they have a little bit of ability to kind of go up and down. And that'll help with uh, increasing or decreasing the amount of lift as they're on the wing. So number one, more thrust. Number four, a little bit more lift driven. 
five, six, seven. Uh, those are just your, you know, going up the up in direction as you're looking. Uh, the greater coverts, um, also known as the greater secondary coverts. Um, then you got the median coverts and the lesser coverts. Again, they overlap one another, create more of an aerodynamic um, function, and you know keep the birds warm as well. Um, and then you've got number eight, which is your tertials, and that's typically you'll find about three feathers per tertial region on a bird. And then the nine is the axillary feathers or the wing pit. Okay, so I figured there's probably folks out here who have a lot more uh, knowledge of planes and um, different and aeronautics at large. Um, so I'm not going to try and become an expert at this overnight, but um, it has kind of been fun to you know examine some of the the forces at play when you're thinking about flight. So um, you know, let's do a little side by side comparison because after all, planes are really designed after birds, right? So birds certainly came before, and um, as plane engineers, uh, uh, you know, came into their work, they really uh, examined um, some of the different shapes on the bird and some of the different forces it played in order to understand uh, the most efficient ways to to fly, right, and build an airplane. So birds and airplanes both have light frames. Um, you know, look at a, uh, let's say a bush plane or a really small puddle hopper, you know, a puddle jumper. Um, you know, you've got kind of a, a simple wing with the same profile as, as both the wing, uh, both the wings on the left here. Um, but then you also have those cross struts. Those struts create some strength. Um, and in some cases, you'll have a by wing, you know, and you'll have two, a wing on top and a wing down below. And there's strutting in between. Um Birds have hollow bones, you know, and some birds have more hollow bones than the next. You know, if you think about um, their uh, their habitat or their behavior, um, you know, it really you can imagine that uh, an ostrich, for example, probably has uh, less ho less need for hollow bones um, than a sandhill crane, for example. So, um, you know, there's 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 difference in the way the bodies are built. Uh, so it's not universal all the way across. Um, now, uh, the, the big piece that a lot of times people think of, you know, um, you know, you look at this bird frame, for example, the skeleton on this image or this slide, excuse me. And, you know, it's fairly complicated. It's got a lot of bones. So it must be built light in order to stay in the air if it's going to be a bird of flight. Um, however, uh, a common misconception is that the lightness of the bones, the hollowness of the bones is what really allows for them to fly so easily. But I would argue that uh, it's actually really a big combination of of those hollower bones and the pneumatic pneuma, pneumatization, which is a, a big word, um, um, but essentially referring to you know their ability uh, to take in to take in air and uh, move out air. And essentially, when birds are developing, they develop air sacs, and typically birds have around nine air sacs um, throughout their body. And as they're actually developing, um, those air sacs actually encroach or penetrate, as some of the terminology you'll find, into their bones. So there's actually, um, when the bones are probably softer at a younger age, um, those air sacs are developing and they're, they're, they're kind of holding their own because that's part of the important physiology of a bird as well. And that creates, you know, that... Um, not only the ability to take on um, oxygen in flight, but also to you know um, to distill and and um, um, you know recycle carbon dioxide, etc. Um, you know really to handle gases at large, but um, it also creates that you know uh, weighted bow, uh, ballast of, of you know that you would imagine with an airplane. So there's got to be a, a pressure change in order to um, keep the bird in a proper position. So, you know, in that last image, I'll go back to it really quick, but you can imagine the direction of airflow when most birds are on the wing and they're flying, you know, um, they're flying straight and airflow is essentially at that point going, uh, you know, directly against them. Um, the profile of the wing depends on, you know, it really determines uh, what happens in the air. So as you can see on both these images on the left over a bird's wing, um, versus over a, an airplane wing, you can see that there's an intentional rise and then that airflow then run rolls off the back end. And by doing so, 
you can change the air pressure and you can create an air foil. And so this next slide um, is a little technical and I won't spend much time here, but um, I found this actually off of a helicopter training video, which I thought was really neat. Um, but you know, the, the, the same principles stand for uh, an airplane wing as well. So you imagine um, you know, the leading edge, the trailing edge, um, the cord would be the length from the leading edge to the trailing edge. And there's a cord line, if you were to imagine a cord line, which is essentially the uh, straightest line across, right? Um, and like a ski, uh, you know, the wing, the, the wing can create camber <clears throat> and that will change the amount of essentially air resistance um, that passes either below or above. It will change um, the, the airfoil's uh, um, composition as it moves across the wing. And so uh, a little bit above some of our heads, but, you know, it's kind of fun when you start to think about the mechanics of it. <clears throat> now, I, I kind of broke down the next series of slides into uh, getting off the ground. Um, and what are the forces at play to do that? And then, you know, once the bird's in flight, um, you know, what is it doing at that point? And then some of the different... Uh, flight forms, whether it's be soaring or hovering or diving or gliding, you know, some of those big, um, those big large groupings of, of how we would def define flight. Um, but so I started off with, you know, getting off the ground and this can look really different. Um, I love this picture of these American coots on the top right, uh, you know, essentially running across the surface of the water and coots are rails. They're not ducks, so they don't have webbed feet. Um, so they probably have a little bit of a different, you know, uh, head start that they need to get, um, than, you know, your average duck species that has a webbed foot, which can get a little bit more resistance and push right off the water. Coots right here, they have lobed toes. And I love these two, you know, really running across the surface of the water. And if you've ever seen this, it's quite funny. You know, I love watching coots <laughs> and they're oftentimes undervalued because they, uh, tend to hang out with all the other showy ducks. Um, and, uh, they're oftentimes masters of, of, um, you know, hanging out with widgeon, for example, and, uh, taking the benefits of the food that the widgeons stir up or other birds stir up. Um, but they're, they're, they're quite smart <clears throat> and, uh, you know, they're pretty, uh, adept not only in, in being in the water, but on land because of their more individual, individual lobe toes. So, um, anyhow, that's one method, you know, is to, to get off the water. That's a whole nother beast, right? And depending on whether you're a green wing teal or you're a canvas back, that's going to look a little different, you know, depending on your size, um, uh, and how, uh, where the legs are positioned on the duck specifically. So some birds get a running start, you know, to really develop that upward force, that airlift right off, right off the water or off the ground. Um, some birds like this uh, rough-legged hawk, you know, is essentially just jumping off of a perch and assuming a gliding position, probably a lot less energy involved in that. Um, however, once they're gliding, uh, you know, allowing that they haven't, um, you know, been carried by wind or they're not being, they're not riding thermals, then they're going to have to flap and they're going to have to generate energy to keep that body up. <clears throat> now, others also have to flap aggressively. You know, imagine, you know, um, a hummingbird, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's got to flap rapidly. However, it's pretty efficient with that and has a lot of musculature ratio compared to, um, wing. So once we're off the ground, woohoo, that's the hard part, right? Um, then, you know, then we're in, then we're in flight. So you imagine some of the forces, um, at play. And this is again, where we need, where our knowledge of, of different feather tracks is important to understand. And the shape and the structure of the wing is going to dictate, you know, what happens in, in the air um, as per the turkey vulture that's down there on the bottom left. So, um, you know, a great, a uh, great tip when you're looking way up at a bird way high and it looks like it could be a raptor um, and you see that kind of uh, iconic V-shaped dihedral, you know, um, in a narrower wing profile um, than, for example, a buteo or a soaring hawk. Um Turkey vultures have a pretty narrow wing, almost like a uh, osprey, but less, um, less wrist. Um, but you know that's that's a good indicator that you got a turkey vulture. So it, certainly at this time of year, as they're arriving. Um, now, <clears throat> it, you know, birds have different ways of of taking 
advantage of these different forces. Um, and turkey vultures are are good at gliding, um, and they have that kind of tippiness to them, um, you know. And that must have something to do with their uh, their feeding mechanism and their sense of smell um, and their ability to locate and get to carrion. Um, so it's pretty interesting. There's a lot of lot to consider when you're thinking about a bird's flight. Um, but let's go back up to this top image. So you got your primary flight feathers, right? Your your fingertip feathers. Um, there they can provide articulation. Um, you know, and sometimes when you see pictures of eagles, uh, their primaries are really spread out, and they're able to kind of almost, you know, do micro adjustments with their with their primary feathers. But mostly they're providing forward thrust, right? So when they flap with those big, powerful primary feathers. They're, they're essentially propelling themselves forward. So you can think of thrust and drag as being on, um, working in parallel essentially with the airflow, right? The direction uh, or the opposite direction of how the bird's flowing uh, or flying, excuse me. So thrust would be in the direction the bird's flying. Drag would be that resistance um, that the bird is meeting as it flies through the air. Lift has more to do with upward or downward. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, the secondary feathers provide, you know, that airfoil, that shape that rolls over um, uh, the upper portion of the wing, over the patagium, and then rolls down uh, the backside of the wing and creates an airfoil. That's going to create some lift, right? And again, those secondaries can kind of go up or down. They don't provide as much thrust, but they're going to provide a little bit more uh, lift adjustment. Tail feathers, those retrices, um, just watch a bird when they land, you know, and it's, or when they're really trying to make a, a, a bank a turn, right? Um, those, those tail feathers play a big role. You watch a, a raven in flight and its V-shaped tail has to do some quick mo movements if it's really going to bank into a landing position or change its course of direction. So they provide steering maneuverability. Um, drag, again, is the retarding force acting on a body and opposite to the direction of motion. Um, and then all those feather tracks work together, um, to, you know, maintain kind of, uh, buoyancy in the air, so to speak, stability, control, and pitch. Um, those are some, some terms for you guys to kind of chew on as you, as you think about flight. Now hovering, you know, um, uh, it's not just hummingbirds that we think of when we think of hovering. You know, if you watch, watch a Says Phoebe or other flycatcher species, stall above the ground and you know they're essentially waiting for the right moment to drop on an insect um that takes a lot of you know calculated energy um you know uh hummingbirds have this ability to beat their wings uh at an unfathomable unfathomable rate excuse me uh 52 plus wing beats per second you know on average that's for the north american species certain species that are bigger um, maybe a little bit slower wing beats, um, smaller. You imagine those little calliopes, um, they've got really rapid wing beats, right? So, uh, essentially the motion when you're hub, when a bird is hovering, they, they need to kind of not only cock their, uh, their body. So they kind of, you know, upright their body a little bit and they're going to get into this. They're actually going to change essentially the plane, plane, the direction, uh, that their, that their wings are operating on from a vertical plane to a horizontal plane. Um, and so by doing that, they can make those, um, uh, amazing adjustments. When you watch a hummingbird, I think they're the only birds that can go backwards, but they can go sideways. They can go forward. They can make all these micro adjustments and it has everything to do with the kind of elliptical shape of their wings and, um, their musculature, which is maybe even overbuilt for their frame, uh, which allows them to really beat their wings that fast. Um, pretty fascinating and really kind of almost hard to digest. Um, but as I wrote up there in the top, equal parts downstroke and upstroke. Of course, when you turn that on the side, it's kind of more front to back, right? Um, now, soaring. <clears throat> you know, soaring, uh, a lot of times I associate soaring with riding thermals, you know. And so, uh, again, thermals are uh, essentially derived from warm air as it, you know, it, as it rises off the Earth's surface and it goes up in a column. And it tends to be kind of, you know, as the day warms. Um, 
and you'll find lots of birds, you know, riding thermals, whether it's, a, you know, a big red tail hawk like this or eagles or ravens. Um, you know, there's a lot of birds or turkey vultures love taking advantage of that because essentially it's very little energy output um, to get themselves up in the air and, you know, perhaps uh, to a point of visibility for detecting food sources. Um, you know, of course, Budios, uh, hawks have that really broad wing. You can see the depth of the wing on this uh, red tail hawk. Um, and you can really understand the power that it has not only in providing thrust, but also the lift gains it gets out of uh, those that broad wing and that really longer secondary feathers too. So not only the primary is really long, but uh, coming off almost the tricep uh, area, those, those secondaries are also providing a lot of buoyancy for the bird. Okay. Gliding. All right. So, um, you know, I had to put in, uh, even though we're all landlocked ourselves, um, of course, we've been seeing some bulls coming through recently. That's been really exciting. Um, but uh, I had to put in a picture of an albatross because it's certainly that's one of the you know, kind of ideal uh, images that pops into my mind with, you know, graceful gliding. Um, and essentially, you know, the wing is deflecting air downward uh, and with little articulation um, or manipulation of the angle of the wing, they can kind of alter that lift force and um, determine, you know, their, their course of direction by way of that. So, um, you know, without drag, uh, a bird would be lost. So they got to have that drag to kind of counter the thrust and uh, with the lift involved to all make flight happen. So they all, you know, it's it's kind of this multi-pronged um, activity <laughs> and, uh, you know, requisite for the, for the job. So um, you can imagine the long wings of an albatross, right? And they give you that long, narrow profile, um, which allowed for just, you know, just like a glider. If you imagine um, an airplane, a glider uh, is built very similar to an albatross, a narrow but long wing. Um, diving, uh, you know, uh, my daughter and I had a great time watching videos of gannets the other day as I was putting together this presentation. Um, fascinating to watch, you know, either gannets or boobies, um, birds that dive in large groups like that, uh, for fish, sardines, etc. schools of fish. And they just commit their body frame to these, you know, plunging dives with a really straight neck. Um, and as I wrote here, you know, there's gotta be this kind of um, chorus of, uh, you know, decision-making amongst their muscles in order to enter the water in a way that's non-fatal. Um, so I think that's pretty fascinating. Gannets can dive into the water. When they hit the, the surface of the water, they're still going 75 plus miles per hour. Whoa, that's crazy. <laughs> um, peregrines, you know, are, are, we like to brag on peregrines, um, uh, because they are, you know, uh, aeronautical masters in their diving, especially uh, 200 plus miles per hour. I think there's been speeds clocked up above 240 miles per hour. So in rare occurrences, um, pursuing prey. So, you know, uh, kids obviously love the peregrines for being uh, the fastest animal on, on, on their surface, right? Um, well, above, above their surface in flight, um, nonetheless, but um, remarkable. And they really create, you know, if you look at a either a prairie falcon or a peregrine falcon, when they're in a diving, in a diving form, a diving position, their bodies are very similar to like a B-2 bomber, right? They're, they're really sleek and they tuck their wings in and they have this almost just kind of... Um, you know, a thicker front end, and then it really tapers down. Um, I got a good picture of a prairie falcon a few years ago um, at the Christmas bird count, and it just shows that torpedo shape perfectly. Um, but it's not as nice of a picture as this one. So um, anyhow, that's enough for diving, but it gives you a sense of appreciation for what those guys do when they're committing to those acts of predation. <laughs> um, you know, and then there's stalling. Uh, uh, you know, which is very similar, some of the mechanisms at play to actually landing. And that requires, you know, a change in the body shape um, or yeah, a change, change in the body orientation and the feather positioning to, to, to deaccelerate. So you can imagine that's, a, a you know, quite a, a force in itself. So the body tilts back, um, the legs reach out just like landing gear on a plane. Uh, the tail feathers spread wide 
and um, help to create steering and they can kind of tilt as need be, um, like I was referring to the Raven. Um, and then the wings, of course, open, um, but they've got to retain some lift because otherwise if, you know, if the wings, um, if you didn't have lift, essentially the bird would just, you know, fall straight with gravity. Um, and so there's, there's a delicate balance there as you're landing, adjusting angles, et cetera. And then these next two slides, I've really just wanted to put some fun pictures up. Um, but, you know, a couple of weeks, let's see, I think it was last month, uh, the presenter to the Women H Audubon Society uh, chapter was Doug Purcell, who is our Colorado Parks and Wildlife, one of our regional officers. And uh, yeah, I paraphrase this from what my memory of what he said, but I thought it was well-spoken and essentially essentially saying that you can tell a lot about how a bird makes its living by the size, the shape, and profile of its wing. So if you're looking at these different birds in this picture, um, you know, an osprey, of course, uh, the osprey is, is, is changing its wing profile to accommodate this huge flounder that it caught out near the ocean um, or in the ocean. Uh, but usually you would see a lot more wrist on a osprey and in a narrower profile than say a hawk, right? Um, but adept at tucking its wings and diving for fish as well. So osprey kind of have some of those uh, profile uh, elements that you find on falcons, um, you know, that really articulated uh, a lot of wrist and a really articulated narrow wings so that when they tuck them, they can really do it efficiently to dive. Um, common nighthawk. You know, common nighthawks and other night jars, um, uh, poor wills, et cetera, have, uh, you know, a narrow, narrow wing, but they also have the ability to make sound with their wings. Um, their feather, feather tracks, something about the way their feathers are oriented, allow them to create this sound they make when they fly. Snipe also, if you imagine like woodcocks, those family have that same winnowing kind of uh, flight noise. And it's actually used for courtship. Uh, so it has a distinct purpose. Um, but the, the actual shape of the feather is actually creating noise, um, which is kind of contrary to an owl's feather. Um, on, on an owl, you can, uh, just a few weeks ago, I sadly found a sawwet owl, a northern sawwet owl on the ground with children um, while we were snowshoeing in the forest. This is about a, mm, two months ago. And I showed the children, you know, um, that uh, the kind of tooth, the comb-like structure on the leading edge of some of the primaries for an owl, which uh, provides for silent flight. So there's all these kind of adaptations with certain groups of birds that serve a direct function, whether it be courtship or predation, um, et cetera, um, or survival. <laughs> um, the scissor tail flycatcher, of course, uh, is really good at hovering um, and, you know, obviously uh, extravagant uh, for courtship behavior, I would imagine. Um, certain ducks, you know, you think of mallards versus, uh, well, let's just think about mallards and teal, some of those, 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 those duck species that can get into really small, tight little ponds and uh, bottomlands and sloughs, um, you know, um, you find in the mountain pond sometimes, and you're wondering how they are able to land in that. And it has everything to do with their wing, right? So um, the profile of their wing is more like a puddle jumper plane, right? Where they can circle in and drop into a tight space and deaccelerate pretty rapidly and maneuver through trees if need be versus um, some of the diving ducks actually, uh, you know, are, are more adept at flying over uh, large, large expanses of water. So, um, and a little bit less sad at, at accessing smaller bodies of water. Okay, I use the same quote here, but again, looking at these different birds, um, you know, you can compare, compare the wing shape of a, a violet green swallow, you know, that kind of triangular um, fighter plane, fighter jet uh, profile that you see from underneath uh, versus um, the yellow legs, the lesser yellow legs in the top right, where it's got, you know, a <clears throat> articulated wrist, a narrow wing, um, you know, and it's going to do better probably with uh, certain types of flight and getting in and out of, um, you know, shorelines versus the swallow who's going to really try and maximize flight and stay on the wing uh, for longer periods of time and to catch insects, right? The goshawk, of course, is adept at, you know, uh, navigating tight forests um, 
and staying well hidden, um, but also at you know at really uh, accelerating with a lot of thrust. So big, powerful primaries uh, and secondaries. So um, for those kind of quick predation means, um, peregrine fowl. Excuse me, um, ferruginous hawk on the bottom right. Uh, that's actually a ferruginous hawk that we've seen. I took pictures of the same bird uh, a few weeks before Daryl here. I think it was when I was scouting for the Christmas bird count. And uh, that um, my pictures didn't come out nearly as nice as this one, but I thought this was a really cool picture from Daryl where it lifts off and you can really see the breadth of the wing um, and the legs are still outstretched as it's taking off. It hasn't even pulled its legs out. It takes a good photographer to, to, um, to capture a bird in that uh, with the correct shutter speed. So, all right, now I have a special treat for you guys, and um, this is a video that I was uh, sent just Monday. Uh, my mother um, shared this with me, um, and it's going to give us a little bit of the flavor of uh, you know what it means to fly, or maybe kind of a, the closest thing that we can kind of experience without a squirrel suit um, uh, to actually being on the wing. And uh, it, it simultaneously feels um, uh, like cheating a little bit. You know, a human has taken a camera and placed it on the back of an eagle. Um, uh, but at the same token, uh, it's quite calming just to, to kind of put our bodies, so to speak, in that of an eagle. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of falconry in Dubai. And uh, I believe this eagle, and I'm not sure what species of eagle this is, um, but is essentially um, a falconry uh, bird and uh, you will see I guess I'll, I'll just stop talking and let you guys enjoy because uh, this was something kind of special I thought to, to witness hopefully you guys will be able to hear the sound of the wind too All right. Well, I hope that was interesting. I thought that um, that video was was something to see, um, especially as you watch uh, that eagle go from um, essentially the cambered uh, lift position it's in um, while it's kind of gliding to seek out its handler uh, to when it tucks its wings in and changes that shape. And all of a sudden, that's all it takes. And it's diving at a rapid rate. Um, straight towards its handler. And the fact that that bird is able to see its handler from that far up, I thought was pretty fascinating. Um, so I will uh, downsize my screen and stop sharing. Uh, love to hear some questions. I wanted to close with this picture of a golden eagle. Um, 
uh, just to kind of bookend, um, you know, because uh, we like to call the golden eagle the king of the birds. And um, certainly a lot of respect for both eagle species. And uh, I thought this was kind of a great shot to see uh, its retrices, tail feathers, and primary and secondary feathers all working hard to, uh, to keep that big body up in the air. So. Okay, let's see. So, um, so let's see, we've got some questions here. What is the usual height of a bird's flight? Um, Peg, is there any way to let folks in to kind of uh, further ex um, expound on their questions? Um, you know, not a way <laughs> because it's on Facebook. It can only type okay. questions gotcha. in. Um, but cool. I could let Peg in if she wants to, to further her question. I would imagine this has to do with, you know, uh, the usual height of a bird's flight. You know, I guess it really depends on the species. You know, it's so dependent. Um, you know, a, a friend of mine that showed that eagle video in Dubai, Dubai said, would an eagle really fly that high? And, you know, uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's certainly kind of an artist, artificial situation. Um, Eagles do fly high up into the sky and they'll ride thermals way up sometimes. Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't know if thousands of feet is the answer, but certainly, you know, um, depending on when they're migrating, uh, they will get up higher. You know, they'll kind of get up and, and try and change that kind of um, find kind of that uh, that tier in uh, uh, the jet stream where, it, you know, they have less resistance, etc. cetera. Um, and then you've got birds like, a northern harrier which loves flying low to the ground you know contouring the slope of the ground um so uh certainly birds that love to just stay low to the ground um except when they're migrating um what adaptations does a bird like a peregrine have to keep their eyes safe when flying so fast that's a great question and i don't know specifically you know you hear about um birds when they're under the water that have you know and birds having that Kind of nictating membrane uh which essentially is like an extra lens um uh for being under the water and that's a good question i'll have to kind of research that one on peregrines when they're diving because there must be some mechanism that um i think it actually has to do with the way that um their their nostrils are positioned on their beak i remember reading this at some point uh, maybe a few years ago and so positioning in terms of um, not only their nares, their, um, their nostrils of sorts, but there's actually like a, if you can imagine a rise inside of their nasal passage right below where their nares are. So it disperses, um, that wind, that air that is coming in through their nostrils as they're diving. And that does, it takes the pressure away from, you know, either exploding, um, their head or creating too much of a pressure to where, you know, it'd be uncomfortable. So that's a great question. And um, I don't know specifically about their eyes, but I do know that their nostril configuration is different. <laughs> Lots of oxygen is used when a bird flies fast. What keeps them from passing out like a fighter pilot might? Um, that's a great question. You know, you hear about um, certain swift species that fly or sleep on the wing. So, um, you know, for hours and hours and hours or, or birds that, you know, like, I think it's, I don't think it's the right white throated swift, but another swift species that essentially sleeps on the wing and will stay on the wing for days on end, which is kind of impossible to imagine. Right. And certainly when you think about those big migratory um, practices or migratory movement, excuse me, um, there's that huge kind of cost ratio of, you know, expenditure. Um, but then you also have a lot of species that, uh, you know, as soon as they see land, it's what they call a fallout and all those be all those birds drop down exhausted, ready to feed. So, um, I don't know. That's, I do, I guess I do know that some swifts, uh, quote unquote, fall asleep. The closest thing that we can imagine to sleep on the wing. That's pretty neat. Is falconry practiced in the U S yes. Um, uh, there is a facility that I've read about down in, Southern Arizona, outside Tucson, that I would really like to go check out. That is a falconry um, 
educational facility and uh, um, a number of different birds of prey that you can you can witness uh, with their handlers there. How do birds fly at night? You know, and that kind of goes back to, uh, you know, these big kind of uh, human projections of, of how we understand birds. But, you know, um, there's a lot that says that they, there's a couple of things at play. There's um, magnetism, there's a uh, star, you know, star orientation or alignment. Um, and then there's also a, kind of a inherited memory um, that birds essentially inherit um, <clears throat> physiologically from um, uh, their mothers and fathers. And uh, they, you know, essentially uh, develop this uh, know with all where to go. And so, uh, you know, I think we won't ever truly understand because we're humans, we're not birds, but um, those are the best kind of projections I can put forth. And thank you so much, Peg. This was, I hope that was uh, what you were looking for. I, you know, I, uh, again, it was uh, certainly a new concept for me to dive into, but no pun intended, but um, uh, a lot of fun. So, and I certainly learned a lot in putting this together. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I personally learned a lot. I'd never really thought about all of the different shapes of wing patterns. So um, thank you and um, have a good night. Likewise, I hope everybody enjoyed it. That was a lot of fun for me too.